Good evening, Shalom, and uh, welcome to our usual Monday night class. Tonight, a little bit unusual. What makes it a little bit unusual tonight is that, first of all, I want to thank Anna and Boris Koko for sponsoring the Shear tonight, remembering Anna's mother, Josefa and Boris. And um, I gave Anna the uh, opportunity. All right, you pick the topic. So she came up with a very interesting, I'm always grateful for the opportunity to explore. And the topic that we're going to talk about tonight is loyalty. And clearly, it's a very broad term. And we'll try to talk about loyalty in different forms and when those loyalties are challenged. So first of all, how do we define loyalty? So I took out a big Webster's Dictionary and Webster's Dictionary tells us that loyalty means being faithful and true in this case here, his first example was to the lawful government, sovereign, basically to whom one is subject, unswerving in allegiance, enthusiastically or reverently attached. Okay, and then true to any person or persons to whom one owes fidelity, lovers to each other, friends to friends, okay. So, I'd like to point out that within our Torah, there is, or are, quite a few expressions and mandates of loyalty. So we're going to start with this week's parasha, and we're going to remind ourselves very quickly that when it comes to one, two, three, the first three of the macros that we encounter in Pasha's Bo'era, this week's Pasha, so it's clear there's a pattern, and Rashi points this out. We're on page 326, so this way we're loyal to our Monday night, finding a concept in the Pasha, and perhaps running with it. So let's start on 326 with plus of 19. So we have the first plague that was brought upon the Egyptians is that of blood. And the rabbis tell us that the first plague was clearly to attack their God. And how so? Not only the river, which was one of the many gods that Egyptians uh, had, and therefore it being changed to blood. But, listen carefully, when the Torah says that within this uh, watch, plague, so the Torah says, yeah, verse 19, so, we'll come back to the beginning. Immoral Aaron, you shouldn't do it. Aaron was to do it. That's the first thing that we're going to talk about. But just as a quick, a very important aside, take your staff, stretch out your hand on all the different waterways of Egypt. Amimim Israel, colon, right? Then, on Narosa. Canals, or rivers, excuse me, Yorehem, canals, Agmehem, reservoirs, Kol Mikveh, Meimehem, and the chapter to blood. Let's go slowly. Vayodam v'chol Eretz Mitzrayim, uvo Eitzim, uvo Avonim. What's going on here? Literally in the, quote, trees, wood, and in the stone. So the rabbis tell us, and Rashi brings it, Try to picture that statue on your mantelpiece, which is made of wood, 
And in your wood, there is the moisture, is water in that wood. And that water inside turned to blood. So imagine that statue on your mantel place dripping with blood. Masha, you need a little bit of a good imagination, but you can only imagine the, the, the screams of like, wow, the, like, w w you know, strange things are happening here, no, no doubt about it, but the fact that it's happening to their gods, all the more, first plague of Egypt. What's of note to us this evening is, why can't Moshe do this? Moshe Aaron, you take your staff, you're the one that stretches, etc. And so what does Rashi say? Take a look. Emor Aaron, left hand column, second line down. Emor Aaron, the fee because Shehegin Hayor Al Moshe, because the water protected Moshe. Kishanishlach the Soho, when Moshe, when baby Moshe was thrown, how many years ago? 80 years ago. When baby Moshe was thrown into the water, and the water, quote, protected Moshe in the sense that his basket floated. Okay? The Fichach, unbelievable, lo lo ka al yodo. If was his Rashi, the waters were not smitten, right? Moshe, who has to take 80 years later, and it's not the same water. David, put your hand down. David says, <laughs> that's right. It's, if you think about it, and wait a second, it's one thing, oh my goodness, Allah was good to me. She went out of her way. Okay, the least I can do is show a little bit of Hakara Satov, appreciation, loyalty to her, etc. But here, loyalty to what? Take a look. The Fichok Lo Loka Ayodo, Lo Bidam, not the first one, which is the blood, the Lo Bitsfired to him, and not the second one, which was the frogs, because the frogs also emanated, came out of the water. And below, and so these two, Baloka Ayyade Aro, and you'll take my word for it, the third one, which is the plague of lice, which also, come on, came out of the ground. So what does the Torah say? Come on, take a look on page 330, same thing. By Yom Hashem, this is the middle of the page, Yud Beis, verse 12. By Yom Hashem, El Moshe, God says to Moshe, once again, in Pasuk, Yud Beis, right? Emor al Aaron, tell Aaron that this is what Aaron should do, take the staff and hachas of Aaron, let him hit the literally dust. And Rashi says, once again, Lo hoyo he'ofor kidai, left hand column, six lines down, on page 330. The, the earth, the dust, was not kidai, Lokosa Moshe was not worthy. Moshe was not worthy to hit. Come on, come on. The, or to be hit by Moshe. Why? The Fisha he gained a love. Unbelievable. Again, approximately 60 years earlier, when Moshe goes out and he sees an Egyptian on the second day, first day, excuse me, sees an Egyptian beating up a Jew. So what does Moshe do? Moshe kills the Egyptian. But what does he do? He buries him <coughs> in, the, in, in the ground. So since the ground, quote, covered up and protected Mo Good evening. I have just one word. Wow. Now remember, you thought the book of Horatius was hard, and you're right, because we always said there are no Bible stories. There are only Bible lessons. Last week's parasha, this week's parasha, is exceedingly difficult. Why? Because Arkadi said, I came, and I came for mitzvos. Come on, where are the mitzvos in this week's parasha? So Arkadi, I apologize, especially if you came out in the rain. Come back next week, and next week, wow, we are chock full of mitzvos. That's it. And that's, after all, our constitution. But this is in our constitution as well. And if it's in our constitution, it's because, and this is what we're starting tonight with this, Derech Eretz Kod Mola Torah. 
The idea is that a person has to be, quote, a mensch, but look how different we are as a mensch than the rest of, quote, society who claim to aspire to be a mensch, that we have, now again, I'm gonna tell you, in my mind, this is one of those favorite lessons of Rav Hirsch that I mention all the time. Rav Hirsch says that the Torah teaches in the extreme. How so? Remember, there is no verse in the Torah that says, a nice Jewish man marries a nice Jewish woman, he is to give her a ketubah. And that is Jewish law, remember that. Oh yeah, now we're not gonna go into it, just wanna see it, you have a chumash in front of you, I'll keep you busy all night. Take a look on page, um, come on, 418. How often did it happen? That's not the point. The fact that a father could sell his daughter. So we're talking about the extreme. The man has to be completely destitute, which means he's got no resources whatsoever. So the Torah says, I gotta tell you, the family, the gentleman that perch, quote, purchases this young lady, okay, so ideally, mister, it's, she's yours. You're a little bit older, you have a son, good. So the idea is, my son, <laughs> look at me, and look where, look where she's coming from. She's coming from this lowest socioeconomic level. So the Torah says, there, in that case, there, you have to provide her with a ksuba and the money for the, uh, for the, uh, the purchase, etc., goes towards it. But the concept of ksuba is found over here. What a strange place, because the Torah is once again teaching that if over here, this girl, she gets a ksuba, then all the more so, nice Jewish man, nice Jewish woman. Uh, we have this in so many places. I can't curse anybody. Again, a Jew can't curse, but it doesn't say, I can't curse this man. You know, it says you can't curse a deaf man. If I can't curse a deaf man, although, and he can't hear, what does that show? It shows that your words have a, a, a koach, there's a power to the words of man. And the Torah teaches that once again in the extreme. So I'd like to begin by saying, good evening. We're gonna talk about loyalty. So unbelievable, what's loyalty? That I have to have loyalty to nature to nature, and that's exactly what you have over here. It's the same water that saved Moshe? No, but yet Moshe is being taught, and when Moshe is being taught this act of, quote, sensitivity, loyalty, so too are we to learn this, and I have to tell you, a beautiful, quick, moving story. But Shabbos, not Shabbos rather, you can take some notes. Just listen carefully. I want you to remember the name Rav Gusman of Oliver Shola. Now, very quickly, what do you need to know about this man? This man was a brilliant Talmud uh, Chacham as a young man. And who was it? I'm quite certain it was the Chaim Ozer, who was his Rebbe, it very much and would often time take walks with him into the forest. Okay. <laughs> and his Rebbe knew this is edible and this is not edible. These plants are edible, these plants are not. Okay. The Rebbe's point, take it out. Good. Several years later, the Waleno, the war broke out. He ran into the forest and joined the partisans and he maintained himself by eating these plants and not eating those plants. Baruch Hashem, he made it to Eretz Yisrael, became a very recognized, prestigious head of the yeshiva. There were plants in Eretz Yisrael in front of the yeshiva. No thank you, please, don't you do it. No thank you, don't you do it. I, 
his job was to water the plants. So, this Tamitim asked, excuse me, but Rebbe, it's an important thing. Why are you watering the plants? With all due respect, you're a busy man, etc. And you know what his answer was. The plants saved my life. Oh, come on. These are not the same plants. Those plants were in the, forgive me, in the forest in Europe. And these are the nice plants that he has growing, come on, in front of the yeshiva. But it's a sensitivity that the Torah is giving us. So as we read this week's parasha, I can say to you, stop yawning. David thinks, <laughs> until we get to next week, until we get to the mitzvot, until we get to our constitution, you know, like, uh, what's, no, there is, or there are rather, some very significant, practical halachos, which, forgive me, some of these are, are even a bit more challenging. Now, they're not as exact as other halachos, which are very clear, what's in the mezuzah, how do you put the mezuzah, etc. But the Torah is giving us a sensitivity. And I really believe that if the Torah is telling us, Moshe, be sensitive towards the uh, inanimate, right? Be sensitive to the water. Be sensitive to the ground, because it protected you, etc. Then, this is the building block that I'm going to be sensitive to go to. If I'm sensitive to, then I'm sensitive. I become a sensitive person. I become a better individual. So this first aspect of loyalty that we have is one which is, again, we can be proud to say distinct. I, I'm not, I don't want to say it's distinctly Jewish, even though I really think it is, but something that our Torah, the dosha itself, is telling us that the, uh, that we quote, are to have this kind of sensitivity, point one. Now, let's go to another concept of sensitivity, all right? Let's start with, once again, to me, this is in the extreme. Okay, you're turning to Parshas Kiseitse. And there in Parshas Kiseitse, the Torah is telling us who can, who cannot, marry into the Jewish people. So on page 1054. The Torah says, Lo Yevo Amoni O Moabib Kal Hashem. 1054 verse 4. Someone from Ammon or Moab cannot marry in. What does that mean? They can become a Jew. They can become a Jewess. But your child, your Jewish child cannot marry someone from Amon and Moab. Okay, and the Torah gives us the reasons why. We're not going to go into that. That's not our topic tonight. But the Torah is telling us, right, that one has to be exceedingly careful in, in terms of, and if you want to say, yeah, from here maybe we have to look at the family. Yeah, you don't only marry the girl, you marry the family. You have in this mixed parish as well that Amon um, marries. Elisheva, sister of Nachshon, very nice, Yichos. But now, let's take a look. I want to take a look at verse 8. Now, verse 8 contains two out of the 613 biblical mitzvahs. Lo sisa'ev adoni. If an adoni comes, someone from the etymology of Edom, Edom is Esau, Esau who Edom. Someone can trace back their lineage to Edom. So unlike Amon and Moa, that the Torah says, excuse me, they could be my Torah partner. I have like partners in Torah on the telephone or in person. I can study Torah with them. But I can't allow my son, my daughter, to marry into Amon and Moa. The Torah says, and don't you push away, don't reject, right, don't exactly, someone from Edom, okay, now wait a second, excuse me, 
There's something stuck in my throat. Read the next three words. Why can't? Ki ochichahu. Edom is my brother. Now wait a second. Okay, Yaakov and Asa played in the same playpen. They came from the same mama and daddy, Yitzchak and Rivka, correct? And therefore, the Torah says, those are the key words. Ki ochicha hu. What does that mean? He is your brother. There's no other way to translate the word ochicha. Now, there's no question about it. Do you do diligence, etc.? But the idea is that when somebody from Asa does convert, the Torah tells us that Dor Shlishi, the third generation, can come in. And wait a second. How about someone who can trace their roots to be an Egyptian, a Mitzri? And what does the Torah say? He too, she as well, is not to be pushed away. Why? What does that mean? Literally, you were, come on, not a stranger. How does he translate that in English? You were a soldier in his land. What does that mean in simple English? Hey, you came down at a famine. You had nothing to eat in Canaan. And, what, and where did your sustenance come from? Don't be a wise guy and tell me it came from Yosef. Yosef fed us with, come on, the produce of Egypt. We were given the uh, community of Goshen. Egypt initially provided for us hospitality. Because they provided for us hospitality, what's the key word, Jeff? The key word tonight is loyalty. The Torah says, we don't forget. And therefore, you can, after the period of time, to, to have that pause between us and them, etc., and to make sure that whoever's coming in. But the idea is that there is something about, wow, family, loyalty, which the Torah is providing for us as, once again, a bedrock of Interesting halacha. If the Torah wouldn't give a reason, okay, it's like shatnings. But the Torah says, no, pochichahu, he is your brother. Geru yisa ve'artso. They provided a service for you. Then since they provided a service, don't tell me that on the night of the Pesach Seder, we sing a very different tune. On the very night of the Pesach Seder, we say, oh, the chayim to paro. No, no, we don't do that. But since, look, Unbelievable, because they provided for us, okay, it shows that whatever negativity was there, you know, uh, at, in terms of, at that time, Pyro and Egypt, they got what they deserved, etc. But there isn't this eternal kind of uh, gap between us and um, Edo, which is Asa, and Mitzrayim, as it does exist between Amun and Lord. Okay. So now, let's talk a little bit about family. All right? Watch. So we're going to start with a verse. We're going to go from one extreme to the other. Once again, tonight, extremes. Moshe can't hit the, uh, the, uh, the water. OK. Now, turn to the bottom of page 308. So on the bottom of 308, where are you? I'm going to take my word for it. You're at the burning bush. And how far into the burning bush are you? You are probably into day five, into day six. This doesn't happen just in one day. There's a, what I call the dialogue. The dialogue gets a little bit, you know, exciting. And the truth of the matter is, when they read the Torah in a three-year cycle, so the, um, the Turgamon, the translator, would, would listen carefully. Moshe says in verse 13, after God tells him in 12, Moshe, you're complaining that you have a speech impediment. In verse 12, 
Go, and I will be, literally, with your mouth, meaning I'll assist you, I'll show you what to say, etc. And now Mo Moshe, finally in desperation, pulls out his card, and he says, Biado, Noi, right, my master, Shlach Noah, please send Biad to Shlach. Send, now Bad Scroll says, hmm, whomever you will send. I don't know how clear that is. Rashi tells us in the name of our rabbis, Pirkei Rebelezer, a very powerful idea. And this is the whole thing. Moshe says, I just can't. I can't do it to my brother. My brother Aaron has been in Egypt for the last 60 years that I haven't been there. He's been the ones holding their hands. He's been the ones giving them it, giving them encouragement. You're going to get out of here. Don't worry. It's good. He's been there for 60 years. And now all of a sudden I say, excuse me, here I am. I'm the one. I'm going to take you. How can I do this to my brother? That's what Moshe is saying. And in simple English, you want to call it loyalty? That's just what it is. It's loyalty to his brother. And not only that, listen carefully now. Until God assures him, look inside. But in the process, Moshe has to do his, God does his. At this point here, God has had it. And in English, the wrath, anger, Hashem is angry at Moshe. And he says, come on, what do you think? That I would let you step on your brother's toes. Nothing to do it. You should know that I own your brother. I know that he's going to speak and he's coming to greet you on the top of the page and he's going to be happy. And the Somach. How many extra words are there in the Torah? Come on. I found one. The top of page 310. He's going to be happy to see you. No. The Somach Filippo. Yusta. Why does the Torah have to say he's going to be happy in, in his heart? Why do I need to know what's because very simply? I have to tell you, I'm a little bit hurt, I'm a little bit offended, but I'm a good faker. I can put on a big smile. Not me, I'm not. Uh... No, the Torah is telling us that God says, I know what's going on in Aaron's heart. I know that you're not going to offend him. I know that you should be able to come with complete uh, trust in me says God to Moshe, and don't be concerned about what? Don't be concerned about loyalty. I'm proud that you are concerned about the concept, but in this case here, the practical aspect thereof doesn't apply because our own will bear no hard feelings, no grudge, etc., that his younger brother is now coming and taking the role that he should take. But again, what emerges from this is an incredible, and you can say it in one of two ways. If you were asking me what's going on here, I would say that this is an incredible kavod habrios. What does kavod habrios mean? Come on for me. Translate for me. Respect for Good. Creation. Respect, dignity of man. In other words, again, there are no stories going on here. There are incredible lessons of menschlichkeit that we're dealing here. Oh, come on. We're dealing with taking out, come on, approximately two million souls of just what you would call the native Jews, all right? That Moshe takes, which means many coming up next week, many non-Jews that he feels are ready to join and with the monotheism, etc. But we're talking about literally a few million people, and Moshe says, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't hurt one man. I can't step on his toes. I can't do this to my brother. I think that's loyalty, Anna, with a capital L. Okay, now watch. We're talking about extremes tonight. Okay, I'm going to tell you right now, and I trust he's going to forgive me. I don't know if every one of these halakhic uh, situations actually were presented to. I think he responds to them, and this is another one of Rabbi Zilberstein's books, whereby he 
presents, and I'm going to give you two cases that he presents. And again, we're going from one extreme of incredible loyalty of Moshe to Aaron. I just can't do it to my brother. And now we're going to go to another extreme. Okay? Please don't hit me. Chevy's here to protect me. I used to wear glasses. Watch. This case never happened, never will happen. All right? I just need to know an answer. Okay? I apologize to all the fathers in the room. I, okay? I didn't write it, but I can show it to you inside. Okay, so uh, a father says to his son who's coming to Israel, uh, please do me a favor and take this package and bring it to so-and-so. So the son doesn't ask his father, hey, Abba, what's in the package? The son takes it, and at customs they put it through. Don't ask, put your hands down what the father was thinking. And the next thing we find out is that Loalino is drugs in there, and the son is taken into custody. And naturally, my high, what's the, the, I don't know, huh? who gave it to you? Assuming he could call his local Orthodox rabbi. Rabbi so-and-so, am I allowed to tell who gave me the package? Just one small consequence. If I tell on my father, my father's going to jail. Am I allowed to tell on my father? So you didn't expect that question tonight, and it hopefully never did, never will, but I need an answer. I need an answer. Okay? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Fred, what do you say, my best friend? Am I allowed to tell that it was my father? You just follow one of the us law. Is gonna, one of us is going to sit in jail. You have to follow the law. Good. And what does the law say? Okay. Now, wait a second. Why? I, I love it. May what? I ask you why, son, you should not tell that his father why? What, what, he, that, that what a son would pray if he would say, my father did. Right. Which law he would pray? That's correct. So, I'm going to tell you right now. We're all familiar with the Ten Commandments, where the Torah says, Kabeid. Kabeid literally means honor, which we know means, don't tell me honor, reciprocate. Right. Right? That's what, that's what that means. They did for you. What they did for you, you have to do for them. They fed you. They uh, dressed you, they took you across the street. Halavai, we should all be in the position, thanks, but no thanks, no, you know. You know uh, uh, tomorrow morning, my son's gonna come and say, I, I went to a class last night, I heard I was supposed to tie, you know, tie my, no, don't, don't you dare tie my shoes, I'm gonna tell my kid, thank God I'm old enough to, uh, I'm well enough to tie my own shoes. But if chas uh, a parent should be in this situation, that they can't tie their own shoes, so technically speaking, it falls on them. Now, it's a, it's a point. Do I have to, uh, I'm a CEO of a, of a corporation, I have to resign my job because I'm like, no, 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 I can hire somebody to do it for me, but the responsibility falls on me. That is keyboard. If you have to, that's what the Torah says in the, in the uh, Ten Commandments, the fifth one, honor means to do for them what they did for you. Good. That's the Gemara in Kedusha, 31. Now, in the uh, third book of the Torah, in Parshish Kedusha, the Torah there says, Ish imobaliv tiro'u. There the Torah speaks of a sense of reverence. So I can call anybody and everybody in this room by their first name, but if my, first, if my father's name were Jack, hi, there's no hi, Jack. I can call anybody else. Hi, Michael. Hi, Boris. He's my father. And there's a sense of reverence. If this is father's chair, I can sit in any other chair except for father's chair. So that's the second place. And now, in honor of Al and everybody else, okay, fasten your seatbelts. I'd like you to turn to page 1074. 
Now, it's not page 1074's fault that it always comes out in the summertime, and so we don't get a chance to study this very often. As much as we do, ouch. So look at verse 16, okay? And I've given you homework for tonight. In English, so in Hebrew it's makler, oviv imo. So I can only tell you, Reb Zilberstein takes the position and says, the son is not allowed to tell on his father. Now wait a second, hold on. You said a minute ago, the son has to do what the law says. And this is gonna bring us to this idea when there is a conflict of loyalties, okay? So in this case here, according to Rav Zilberstein, this verse, which tells us in a rather umbrella sense, the curse is the one who degrades his father or mother, sending father to jail would be a, um, full, a, a violation of, and therefore the son sits. Yes. But maybe father has an explanation about why he sent his back to and there won't be a question in it. Well, to the best of our knowledge, I don't think there's a good explanation that's going to free one of them from going to jail. That's number one. But I think that, you know, and remember, this is an extreme, but I think it's very important because we learn from the extremes. But I have to tell you, and I have to bring this one up, and be careful, because you can't always be medame, milsa, the milsa, which means one case to another. Now watch this. The second one is a bit more, let's say, I don't want to use the word realistic. I'm sorry this came up, but I have the following situation. I have a gentleman who is a doctor, who works at, let's say, Shaarei uh, Tzedek or any other hospital uh, by day, and he also has his own clinic. And his daughter is a nurse who works for her abba, and everything is fine. Except, what's the except? <laughs> she notices uh, today it's uh, gauze, and, and tomorrow it's syringes, and the next day it's uh, you know syrups. That the father, the doctor, helps himself to supplies from the hospital each day, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, and he stocks his clinic with the goods that he's taking from the hospital. Now, no daughter should ever be in this situation. The daughter sees what's happening. Abba. <sighs> It doesn't seem right, you know, uh, etc. Oh, come on. She tells him more than once, and he even has the chutzpah to answer her and say, come on, lo saxon shor bedisho. Now, if, if it wasn't so hurting, I would laugh. Though Saksam Shobadisho is a violation of the Torah, I'm warning you that when you have an ox and your ox is threshing the, uh, the grain and it's going round and round and he's working for you and he's accomplishing what you want, he's separating the good from the bad by threshing it, etc. But the, the ox, don't tell me he had lunch uh, an hour ago and he might have been well fed, but he can smell and he knows that he is working with uh, tvua, with grain. So the Torah says, I'm warning you, don't muzzle the ox while it is threshing. So first of all, I want you to be proud. 
This is one of the 613 laws of the Torah, that it plays a significant role in the technicality of Makos, leave that alone for the moment. Okay, it's one of those probably many laws, which once again, sensitivity, you have to be sensitive to the animals, all the more so am I going to be sensitive to man, halavai. Okay, so the Torah says just that. So what does it mean? It means in the context of that there, that the, come on, the, uh, the animal is permitted to take a nash every once in a while, which means he can benefit from, so that was his, forgive me, joking but, but terrible uh, explanation that he gave, that as the ox eats, I could take some of the uh, syringes, etc. Okay, if father persists, must the daughter, can the daughter, should the daughter tell the authorities? And the answer is? Yes, she can. Yes. In my opinion. Yes. And the same rabbi, now listen carefully now, the same rabbi who says that you sit in jail and you don't incriminate your dad, the same rabbi says that in that case there the daughter must if she tries one way or another, etc., and she doesn't succeed, and her father is, God forbid, stealing, let's use the word, what's the difference? Okay, can anybody tell me the difference between the drugs and the, uh, and the syringes? You can't see the difference. I, okay. would, I would suggest that, don't think about loyalty, ultimate loyalty is to Hashem. To Hashem. Good. And there is a <laughs> commandment, do not steal, which Good. is clear, right? That's right? Do not steal, and the father, in the second case, is stealing, clear. <coughs> so the daughter's loyalty should be to Hashem, not to father, not to, because I could suggest that if we try very, very much, we always could find some Mitzvah among 613, which could kind of explain why he, he found it, um, Tom yeah, put him on. Yeah, but, God, but right, but we know that was time, more than I would, I, I'm puzzled why in the first case, don't this regain this, 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 this um, what to do with the father name? Son has the same name as the father. He is the son, Ben Ov. Okay. So anyway, if he went to jail, the father's name will be this uh, how to say the great the the at, at the same time. Yeah, the, the name might be disgrace, there's no question. But the question is who is the one who is, forgive me, sitting in jail. Rev Silberstein's distinction between the two cases is as follows. He says that clearly in both cases, the person who is doing the terrible wrong must be stopped. Okay, must be stopped. Torah law, drugs are you know, prohibited. Civil law, they're prohibited. The man must be stopped. The fact that the son is going to take the rap and sit in jail, that will completely stop the father from further engaging in this practice. Well, you don't think so? Okay. I said, well, this is what I said stuff. He said that this is going to be a breakdown of, forgive me, his menu chasad nefesh is going to be a breakdown of his shown by whatever it is, etc. So this is his thing that he stands on. And that will, however, here, where the father is, forgive me, a band-aid hair and a serene chair, you know, etc. No, the answer is if he is not stopping, then he must be stopped. And listen carefully, uh, the law says that she has to have her father stopped and tell the authorities and whatever's going to be is going to be. Now I have to tell you, I want to just introduce you to another uh, aspect of Jewish law. This other aspect of Jewish law is called Mesira. Now literally Mesira means to hand somebody over. Can a Jew hand over another Jew to the authorities. Now we're going back over time, starting with the days of the Talmud, we are more often than not giving over a, a Jew, telling the government that this person has uh, assets, etc., uh, would not be uh, ending in a good result. 
And oftentimes, not only is he going to lose his property, but he might very well lose his life. So the halakha is very strong against giving somebody over. Now, listen carefully. The following case actually happened, where I have I like this so much, I'm just sorry to pick this topic, because uh, in my uh, uh, working on this, ouch. Look, you have to understand, zeh l'uma zeh, as the wise King Solomon says, that this man always has free will, okay? And there's always that choice, good or. So I have a uh, kosher butcher who is violating his oath and uh, his trustworthiness of being just that of kosher butcher, and we find out. And we, uh, we, we say to this gentleman, come on, you're a Jew. We Jewish people know how to uh, take care, and I don't mean it in a, in a negative sense, but through a din Torah, we'll sit down and see how we can no, I will not come. I will not come to a din Torah. So they asked <coughs> Rav Moshe, uh, no, excuse me, I think it was Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, actually, uh, the They asked him, are we permitted to take this person to the authorities? He says, you're not permitted, you must. In other words, if someone is doing evil, they are to be stopped. And if it would not be considered a case of quote unquote Masira. And they said to him that the, uh, the government might very well put this person in jail. And the halacha says, so be it. He's going to jail. And uh, if that's what it takes to stop him. Now, I have to tell you, just as a quick aside, because Everything gets so, the best word I can use is technical and complicated in the following sense. By the way, there will be a minor after this. We'll have our own thing. Okay, so I didn't have my yet either. So if I apologize if we, we'll go a few minutes after this, but there will be a minor. Thank you. All right. So the, um, I, I was up to jail, correct? Huh? Yes, we are That's right. So you have to understand that the, the issue is, and this is very important, we live, thank God, and we're very appreciative, in a quote, just government. So, says Rob Waldenberg and Sis Eliezer, that today the laws of the Sira are not as binding because after all, living in a just government and the penal system today is a whole lot better than what it was yesteryear. And he might be right. Rav Moshe says today you still can't, once you send somebody uh, to jail. So, and what do I mean by that? Okay, so assuming I know that uh, the fellow who's dominating next to me in shul, nice guy, does not pay his income tax. Okay? So interestingly, I asked my uh, local tax lawyer, as a good citizen, I shovel my walks, I vote, I this, I that, am I obligated to, uh, to call the IRS? And the answer is no. As an American citizen, I know that you're not paying your taxes, I don't have to be a yenta, I don't have to pick up the phone and say, by the way. But if I do, and it's true that you did not, and uh, but I get 10% or whatever, okay, fine. So, so listen carefully. If a Jew would pick up the phone and would inform, he would be in violation of the Siva. That that person is doing something wrong, you don't have to be God's watchman, and you don't have to, uh, none of them don't have to, you're not allowed to. And especially, I'll just add today, uh, yes, it would be, but not be, I don't know, necessarily a prison sentence, but I can only say, and this is a real chabal, 
And we certainly are proud of the freedoms given to us in this country. And I can only tell you that I have visited different jails over the years, and uh, life in jail very, very often. And I'm not talking about the white collar uh, jails where I just have to get this off my chest. It just bothers me that maybe there's chont on Shabbos, and you'll say, you, you're a nice guy. If you have chont, why can't they have? I just know and see what that causes to the other, not Jewish inmates, that the Jews, okay, have special treatment, etc. Okay, but in, not in white collar prisons, crime prisons, the life too often is literally horrific. So it would be very much a problem to quote unquote turn in another Jew. So again, loyalty to my people, loyalty to the land in which I live. So this is a, a very interesting, perplexing, and let's just take a quick peek. Because once again, when the Torah gives us these quote stories, we know that it's not stories, we know it's lessons. Bottom of 172. What does the Torah say? Yaakov is telling his servants, he's sending an extensive um, gift to his brother. Bottom line, Ki et goshva Esav achi, when my brother Esav meets you, who she'elva, and he asks you, Lemor, Lemi Akto. Now remember, each word here is hand counted by Hashem. Lemi Akto. So in the context of this story, Esav is asking, tell me, uh, whose are you? Meaning, to whom do you belong, right? Etc. that you're accompanying this gift. But on a sailing, and where are you going? Stop. And who will be Ayla? And whose are these, meaning the sheep, your possessions, the funnel? So Rav Salvation said that this line here is such an important, pivotal line for loyalties. Again, you're going to tell me that just keep on reading, keep on reading, and you're going to tell the oh, Amarito, and you are to tell Asa, the Abdullah the Yaakov, to who, who are you, who do you belong, to who are your loyalties. My loyalties are first and foremost to Abdullah the Yaakov. Now, the, the, there are very, very interesting halachos that talk about Dina de Malchusa, laws of the land. I live in this land, I have to pay taxes to this land. Not only that, Rav Moshe Feinstein, say the side of the Rav, wrote that really it's our obligation to vote. We are blessed by the many, many freedoms and benefits that come to us in this country, we should exercise our privilege and show our appreciation by being part of this democratic process, etc. But in terms of your identity, who are you? The Amarto, the Abdukho, the Yaakov, and listen carefully now, but in terms of Ulumi Eila, the Fanefa, these sheep, i.e., my talents that I'm able to contribute to society, this min fahishlucha la domi In other words, there is this very powerful interplay between who I am, ultimately I as an individual, and and I have in front of me a article that was written by the <coughs> of Egypt, an interesting one. It's good for the one if you have trouble sleeping at night time. 
This will help you because over time you need a dictionary to understand his English. But aside from that, um, so when my brother meets you and asks you, who are these? And that was going before you, this is what you tell him. Who are you? To whom do you as a metaphysical being, as a soul, as a spiritual <coughs> personality belong? All right, again, your loyalty and where and whither goest thou, to where are you going? To whom is your historical destiny committed? Okay, right? To whom have you consecrated your future? What is your ultimate goal? Your final objective? The Abdu These two inquiries are related to your identity as a member of a covenantal community. This is one loyalty. However, Jacob continued. My brother Ishmael asks the third question. Whose are these before you? Are you ready to contribute your talents, capabilities, efforts toward the material and cultural welfare of general society? Are you ready to present me, meaning Asa, with gifts, oxen, goats, camels, and bulls? And take out those words of oxen, goats, camels, and bulls, and put in medicine, and put in technology, and put in law. And the answer is, this third inquiry is focused on the temporal aspects of life. So, this is where the Jew you know, uh, has his uh, juggling effect. I want to close with the Ahavta Nuriyaka Kamoka. We're talking about loyalties, correct? So we started out with loyalties towards, we went loyalties towards family. Right? We started out with the uh, in, uh, <coughs> the water and the dust, etc. Uh, those aspects which are literally lifeless, okay, number one. And then I go to the familial, brother, father kinds of situations where when there is that tension, we saw father and daughter, the daughter had to tell the authorities on her father because their, their loyalty to the after the literally means, so I'm to love my mate. Come on, I can't love. I love everybody in this room. I love everybody in this room as much as I love myself. Impossible. And God knows that it's impossible. So, I have, and I have to tell you a very, very nice interpretation of this verse. So, watch this. The after the I have to love my neighbor, okay? So literally, Kamocha means like you. No, Kamocha means who is like you. Now what does that mean? I have a, print, a printing shop. Well, thank God I do very nicely in town. Good, make a living, everything is good, etc. And all of a sudden, this guy here, uh, three blocks away, right, opens up a, uh, a sign, coming soon, you know, uh, express printing. Okay, now what? So what do you mean now? There are obviously two possibilities. Don't even think of going to him and I'm gonna start telling you things about this guy. Oh yeah, yeah. You wanna right? That's one type of a, a response, etc. But before he even opens up, you don't wanna even meet the guy because he's a terrible guy, etc. Or no. You ready? You have to react. I have to love my Rea, my friend, okay? who is like me, my competitor, if I understand that whatever I'm going to make this year has been determined on high, on Rosh Hashanah, then guess what? We don't buy from him. That's it. In other words, I'm going to help him start his business. That's what loyalty is in terms of you have to our Torah is nothing less than uh, bringing us up and giving us the opportunity to rise and to grow. And finally, Rashi on the Aftarath of Kamocha in that famous story in Gemara Shabbos in Islam where the uh, convert comes to Hillel, convert me on one foot, 
and uses that verse, including the Aramaic, the negative, the two Hebrew one, but basically it's, it's the verse. He tells him, you have to learn Achol Kalokho. So, what did you learn tonight? I hope you learned a few different things, but finally and ultimately, Rashi cites a verse to show that the word Rea is none other than HaKadosh Baruch Hu. God is considered our ho-ho. Pete to come out on a rainy night just to hear this. That God is considered our Rea, our friend. And this idea is found not only in that puzzle of Yahatan Yachal Kamoch, of course, we know, and we've learned this so many times, and again, this excitement and appreciation that the Torah is understood on so many different levels. So I want to show you, if you turn to uh, Parshas uh, Balak, all right, so what do you find? That in terms of the relationship between God and the Jewish people, what does Bilam say? Usruas Melech Bo, all right? By Bakori, who's honoring me tonight in coming. Um, here it is, bottom of page 866. Okay, so take a look. It's one of those, ooh, why? Because it's one of those verses that we incorporate in terms of the psukim on Rosh Hashanah, who are true, okay? Ah, oh, and Art Scroll helps us out, take a look. Because of all the interpretations, take a look what he says. This is 21 at the bottom of 867, or 866, verse 21. He perceived no iniquity in Jacob, saw no perversity in Israel. Hashem, his God, is with him, and the friendship of the king is with him. Usruas Melako. Wow. What did you learn tonight? Come on. Let's go around the room. I'll ask everybody. Fred, one more time. Tell me about the relationship between you and God. Ooh, Ovinu. And you're right, He is our Father. Okay, Lu, Allah, tell me, Malkinu. And you're right, He is our King. And this is what we say on special occasions of Vinu Malkinu, etc. Good. And now, what are we closing with tonight? Usruas Melech Bo. He is our friend. I'd be wrong if I just said he is our friend. Roy, he is our best friend. He's not our friend. Because what's a friend? Let's end with that key word. Loyalty. Loyalty means that a friend is there for you. Now, we could have gone to another example of amazing. Amazing. I could give you a hundred reasons why Avram Avinu should not go to war to rescue his uh, nephew, Lot. Okay? In the nicest way possible, tell me a little bit about, come on, David, it, 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 give me in a nice way. Tell me something about what, what has become of Lot. Remember the Torah tells you, uh, where's he living? Uh, he happens to be living in Sodom, right? So if, if somebody is attracted to living in stone, there's something about the stone environment, way of life, that unfortunately uh, he can live with. So he's become, forgive me, it's not a nice word, a degenerate. And Abram is going to risk his life to save a load. Why? I'm not pointing on that. It's all your fault. Loyalty. That's what it is. He said to Lot, we have to part because I just can't tolerate your stealing. And you're doing it in a way that's basically legal, etc. I can't, I can't be a party of some, but because after all, we are family. What does Abram say? Ima Yamin Hasmeila. You go to the right, I'll be there at your left. You go to the left, I'll be to your right. And he goes, and he does. And that's where we come from. 
So there is this incredible loyalty of family, and there is what it means to be a good friend, but let's just remember what a good friend we have upstairs in Ovinu Shabbat Shemayim, literally our Father in Heaven, right? We say it every day, whenever we, especially Shabbos, Yom Tov, you have to have bread, you have to recite bread. It's very, very interesting. Which came first? They wanted to have bread, so Rabbi Grimberg said, no, no, he's a very practical guy. The Torah wants you to have a meal, and the meal is defined by bread. So once I uh, have to have bread, so I have to recite the grace of the meals at the end. And if you ask me, I'm sorry. I say that all week long, who's got time to say the grace of the meals? But on Shabbos, you have to say the grace of the meals. Well, Sophia, if you're going to say the grace of the meals, then you have to why, have bread. So, okay, you're right, but I'm right, okay? But what do we say in that, you know, grace after meals? That man, he is the one that provides for us. And guess what? Day in, day out. Amazing, right? What he does it. So if we leave tonight by realizing how, capital L, loyal he is to us in the sense that he gave his word to Abram, to Yitzchak and Yaakov, how loyal he is to his word. And he said that your progeny, pinch yourself, because each of us are the descendants of Abram, Yitzchak and Yaakov, this very special loyalty of family to family, etc. And we're there for one another. And uh, therefore, Hashem has been providing for us. The excitement is that we return the favor in kind. We are loyal to Him, and uh, we, our, our learning tonight should not only be an ilui for the neshama of Yosefa, Bas Boris, but it should at least remind us how proud we should be that, like other areas of law, even the concepts of loyalty are you know, somewhat unique to our people, and help elevate us to be a, uh, a better person, a believing person, and hopefully, as a result, better citizens as well. Thank you.